Before we do introduce Oliver Withers, I believe is waiting online. We have a short clip from Credit Suisse that speaks a little bit to what is materiality in their universe around capital conservation and also importantly how the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals could inform portfolio construction. Nature is a critical contributor to the global economy and is worth over 125 trillion US dollars. Yet time is running out for many of the delicate ecosystems that support the great diversity of life on Earth. Despite biodiversity's importance for a functioning planet, we are losing animal and plant species at an alarming rate. Vertebrate populations have declined by 68% from 1970 levels, and two in five plants are estimated to be threatened with extinction. It is also projected that over half the world's marine species will near extinction by 2050. In addition to mitigating the effects of climate change, biodiversity supports billions of livelihoods dependent on agriculture and fishing. Biodiversity loss poses huge risks to financial markets, as more than half of the world's GDP, around 44 trillion US dollars, is moderately or highly dependent on nature and its services. However, two of the least invested of the UN Sustainable Development Goals from a private capital perspective are Life on Land, SDG 15, and Life Below Water, SDG 14. How can investors take action now? An important first step for investors looking to tackle biodiversity is to assess their investment's impact on nature and wildlife as well as their portfolio risks related to biodiversity loss. For investors to be able to truly address their impact on biodiversity loss, reduce biodiversity-related portfolio risks, and source investment opportunities that support biodiversity, it's important that financial institutions understand the causes and drivers of the issue. Global biodiversity finance makes up just 0.1% of global GDP. But with biodiversity expected to be one of the most important topics in the investment world by 2030, we need to start making the case for natural and conservation capital as an investable asset today. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome Oliver with us from Credit Suisse um, at our summit this morning. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us all the way from London. Dave, thanks for having me. And I think our viewers will be quick to pick up your South African accent. Uh, excuse us for maybe a, a tendency towards home bias, and, but we did uh, pray or at least do some sort of emotional blackmail and getting you involved in our event today, obviously knowing Nedbank and, and Ned Group relatively well. Um, before we do get into the questions, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction to, to Oliver and his thick history in the finance industry. Um, prior to Credit Suisse, Oliver was head of um, conservation finance and enterprise at the ZSL, or the Zoological Society of London, a very well-known enterprise around the world, and with ult ultimate responsibility with projects and, pro and programs around biodiversity impact, specifically in both the green and the blue economies. And I think both these two terms will come out strongly during the course of today's summit. Um, I'm going to read this list because it does run quite lengthy. Um, this included specialized projects um, in rhino conservation, uh, marine plastic, fish stocks, uh, palm oil, timber, and rubber. So Oliver is definitely a wealth of knowledge, and I think we'll enjoy what he has to say today. Um, Credit Suisse have done some pioneering work in having a real-world impact um, in the way that they invest. And I think a lot of what Oliver says today will really kind of flip upside down your thinking in terms of what ESG investing is or was or is. Um, they've also focused their biodiversity strategy on bending the curve, and we're going to stick up an image in a bit um, that will kind of lend itself towards a concept and at least can conceptualize exactly what we're talking about when Oliver mentions bending the curve. Um, firstly, Oliver, I think maybe let's start with something a little bit personal uh, to introduce to the crowd. Um, I know European banks, having been at Deutsche Bank in London myself for a number of years, are a very cosmopolitan uh, place to work. Uh, you coming from South Africa, I guess, how has this shaped your relationship, at least your lived experience in conservation and biodiversity? Because I imagine within your cosmopolitan team, um, your history brings something different to the table than maybe some of your colleagues from the Americas uh, or Europe or Asia for that matter? 
Yeah, thanks, Dave. And, and just thanks again for having me here. It's great to, to see uh, financial institutions taking the lead like you guys are on the topic of biodiversity. It, it really is so important. Um, yeah, listen, I mean, make no doubt, uh, coming from South Africa, I think all of us are, are embedded with some sort of baseline understanding and appreciation for conservation efforts. Uh, I think that the park system that we have in South Africa at a national level and a provincial level is, is quite frankly, world class. Uh, and, and that is a real spoil that we have uh, as South Africans. And so I think that that immediately predisposes you to understanding and appreciating the role of financial services in a conservation context. Um, but also, I, you know, I think it's also important to highlight that there's a flip side to that, right, which is we perhaps uh, are very focused on conservation efforts and, and not always focused on, on the role that uh, corporates can play in terms of kind of their footprint and how do we reduce that footprint in the future. Um, so make no doubt, uh, South Africans are, are leading uh, the fight in this agenda. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, the person leading our net zero strategy, uh, climate uh, at Credit Suisse is a South African as well. Okay, it's wonderful to hear. We always love championing our, our local folk doing uh, wonderful and great things um, on a global spectrum. Um, maybe I didn't bring this up earlier in your introduction, but you were head, I think, of a, a, a pan-African or global asset manager before and then stepped into sustainability finance. I mean, what was a large motivation for that? Is it something that lies close to your heart or was it a natural evolution being an African-style investor? I mean, to be quite frank, David, it was... Uh... It was a, a penny drop moment for me. We were we were selling a Pan African Equity Fund uh, in London. We were talking to a couple of institutional investor investment managers that were early adopters, if you will, of of impact ESG considerations, and they really wanted to understand what were the the human development benefits of uh, the investments we were making. And that led to me coming back to at that point Johannesburg and and scratching our heads, saying, okay. You know, this is clearly an emerging topic that's got traction, um, and you know, it's a, it's a nice challenge to have, um, where we're now starting to think about how we allocate capital to achieve more than just a financial return, right? Um, and that, for me, was a a moment, you know, selfishly, if I'm honest with you, that I realised I could pursue, you know, if you will, a, an agenda in sustainability, but stay within the finance field. Um, and, you know, I think really, really importantly is that that broader sustainability agenda is what allowed me ultimately to focus on biodiversity as a topic. Um, and I think it talks to this idea that we've got to really tear down silos, right, that we can't address these things as purely biodiversity or purely climate or purely social. Uh, and the reality that we face every day, and I think intuitively we all know it as well, these are all interconnected topics. Yeah, I think you've made an incredibly valid point and you've even stolen words I think that I've kind of shared with my colleagues over the years as well is the sustainability challenge is often defined as breaking down those silos, the way that society operates and biodiversity. I know our webinar today is focused on biodiversity specifically, but also a key message is that there is that intersection with biodiversity and climate change um, and, and social and inclusive growth. And I think um, you can't talk about those as being mutually exclusive. We did show a video earlier in the webinar during the introduction, um, in fact, narrated by the great Sir David Attenborough, which tried to define biodiversity. I think a lot of people that have dialed in maybe feel this might be an ambiguous term or can't kind of articulate it um, correctly as it should be in the, the A to Z form. But um, how do you at Credit Suisse define biodiversity? And I guess maybe more specifically biodiversity investing or investing in biodiversity. Because I know when we caught up, I think a couple of weeks ago, when I posited the, the idea of the summit, you spoke about materiality and what is material to you. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. I mean, listen, the, the definition of biodiversity, uh, you know, the, the real definition lies within the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, and I'm not going to do justice just repeating that uh, verbatim. But the way we are, we are approaching it as a, as a bank is that it, it really is, it's the variety of life and everything in between it, right? And so that talks to species. And I think that as South Africans, that's often things that we are very kind of aware of species. We're very aware of the plights of the rhino, for example, in a South African context. But, you know, very often it's the ecosystems and everything in between that's holding those species uh, together that, you know, is also part of biodiversity. And so for us, it's, it's really looking at species and ecosystems and that variety 
And I think the key thing that that you know is really important is that we have this genetic diversity, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, we're seeing different. Uh, geographies, different regions, different species that are under different threats, right? And some of those are are really urgent threats that we need to address today. Um, and that really talks to this concept of materiality, right? Um, it's a really, really broad topic. Um, it's not easy like climate, where climate, we have a single metric in degrees uh, that we can use to kind of convalesce around and, and really target activities towards specific goals. We battle to measure biodiversity because it is so complex, right? Um, but just because we can't measure it perfectly doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and make progress in this space. Mm. And, you know, we know that, that when the science tells us that one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss is in fact agriculture, mm. right? And we know that deforestation and land use conversion is a significant driver of that biodiversity loss. I mean, some estimates suggest that forests are around 75, 80% of terrestrial biodiversity, right? Mm. And so just by drilling down on that simple sector, that topic, we, we really are getting to where the materiality exists, right? And so a lot of the time we're under pressure um, to make firm wide policies and understand all of the implications, but actually there's a real benefit benefit to, to people just focusing on where the materiality is. And as we all know, as South Africans, you know, biodiversity is spread unevenly, right? Across geographies um, and each firm, each investor, uh, ultimately has exposure to different geographies. And, you know, that means that you know, each firm's materiality around biodiversity is going to be different. Uh, and I think another key thing is this concept of double materiality, right? We know that there is a lot of focus on, for example, uh, reducing the risk that companies are exposed to. Right. So agriculture sector is heavily dependent upon biodiversity in order to generate the yields that it does. Right. But agriculture is also a risk to biodiversity. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is this acknowledgement that both of those materialities are important and we need to try and measure them in a best efforts approach. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, as the world's population starts getting towards, I think, is it 9 billion by 2050? Uh, what came up in our asset management review, which so we review, sort of, I think it was close to 50 asset managers, both local and global, um, sustainable farming and agriculture was a very key, a key concept that continued to, to pop up in our discussions with them. And you mentioned biodiversity and within agriculture, the, the duality or the dichotomy, I'm not sure if we, which one's the right term. Um, but in terms of, you know, you needing bees, I think bees is well documented in terms of what their populations are doing um, to pollinate your crops, etc. Uh, but not just animals, I think also plant diversity as well. And, you, you know, think about just the seeds and sustainable farming practices. And I'm not going to get into your Monsantos and your Syngentas, etc. today. Um, but I think, you know, when last we caught up, I think two weeks ago, you were just mentioning about some of those farmers in KwaZulu-Natal and how many of them are actually proactively pursuing sustainable agricultural practices and it is a little bit thin but it was encouraging you to hear to, to hear you open up at the start of today's session to say that South Africa is leading in certain things like conservation and I think we can take that to heart um, on the concept of materiality um, I'm going to see if the tech guys here can bring up um, an image which you and I did touch on as well and I've seen this before and I was incredibly chuffed to hear that you guys are using this at Credit Suisse um, it's almost maybe a guiding frame we call motivation to some of the work that you're doing it is the bending the curve on biodiversity loss, or at least of biodiversity loss. And it almost looks like the inverse of what we've come to expect from a climate change curve. You know, the climate change curve, the CO2 emissions does this, and we're trying to bring it down. Um, but biodiversity is the other way around, where it's dipping. And of course, we're trying to at least bring it back up, if not put a complete stop to the deterioration that we are seeing. Um, I don't know if you have any comments you want to make based on this curve and how you guys are using it. Dave, absolutely. And I mean, I, you know, I think it talks to this this idea of there really are two levers that we, we, we can focus on, right? And again, I think what's critically important is, and a major learning we should all take from climate, is we, we need to really trust the science, right? 
and, and we need to be in an enabling environment for the science to become useful to us. Uh, and I think that the bending the curve report um, and uh, the conservation and mitigation hierarchy, which was published beginning of last year, if I remember correctly, building off that bending the curve. This notion that, you know, as South Africans well know, as we've discussed, conservation efforts are critical, right? We, we have designated protected areas. There are, are endeavors to try and have 30% of the planet uh, designated as, as protected areas. And that really fuels this conservation agenda. And that's super, super important. Uh, but almost more important uh, and, and really exciting in terms of the role that financial services can play is in terms of mitigation, right? And when we look at that bending the curve um, image, you know, there is the conservation efforts that if we ramp up those conservation efforts, we can perhaps, you know, start, you know, preventing the curve from, from hitting rock bottom as quickly, but it's never going to bend us back to where we need to be, right? And we're only going to get there if we adopt mitigating approaches. And, and that really talks to responsible consumption and responsible production, right? And again, picking on agri, you know, Yes, it, it's historically the biggest driver of biodiversity loss, but the exciting thing is it's also arguably the biggest opportunity, right, that we have in terms of mitigating future biodiversity loss and feeding into a, a landscape restoration agenda where we start getting into conservation and net positive biodiversity results. Uh, I really like the way that you put that in terms of finding opportunity um in something that is so negatively impactful. Um, but just, I mean, looking at that curve there, you can see it is incredibly worrying as you head towards that green patch and at least to, towards the gray patch at the bottom there anyway on that lone deer at the bottom there. But um, I wanna, I'm very loath <laughs> to ask this question is around greenwashing in the industry. And I'm, this is gonna lead on to another question because I am curious to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, we, you know, we chat amongst ourselves here in South Africa. We partner with a few global managers as well, but what's happening, the talk around it on the ground in the UK, you do have the sustainable finance disclosure regulation coming out, the SFDR. And then leading on to that, I think you guys at Credit Suisse have really come up with some wonderful, wonderful products, which, you know, I've been reading at a decent length over the course of the last few months. Um, I wanna want to ask you, through a bunch of those, and sorry, this is a very long convoluted question, but the one that grabbed me was, um, I do want to get this right, was your Ocean Engagement Fund. Um, and, and I want to hear a little bit more about this fund and the philosophy behind it as well. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So, I mean, listen, we're, we're really lucky from an impact perspective uh, that I have a colleague, James Gifford, um, who was the founder of uh, PRI, um, so the principles for responsible investing. Um, and James is very much our thought leader in terms of defining what impact uh, is versus, for, for example, thematic. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm using, I'm picking on, on James uh, as an example of our broader framework in terms of how robust we really are taking the classification of products to avoid greenwashing, right? And I mean, I'm obviously only looking at it from a biodiversity perspective, um, but you know, we, we have a very clear framework for understanding how we want to classify product uh, under our sustainable investment framework. Um, and similarly, as a bank, we have a sustainable activities framework, uh, which incorporates biodiversity considerations into a number of transactions before we will consider them sustainable if you will. Um, so I think greenwashing risk is very real. Um, I think that if I'm honest with you, I view it as slightly flattering for the sector, right? People are only doing it because sustainability is mainstream now. And the reality is, is that when you start looking at increases in assets under management and different classifications, it doesn't matter how you are classifying ESG, it is a growing sector and a rapidly growing sector. And so, you know, having this greenwashing is, is a flattery, if you will, in the sense that the sector is real, it's not going anywhere, and it is going to, in my opinion, become the predominant sector, right? Mm. But that does mean that we, as responsible practitioners in the industry, need to be especially careful around how we approach this space. Um, and I think that we are going to make mistakes 
right? And I think that we need to ensure that we have a culture that allows us to make mistakes, acknowledging that they are mistakes. Whereas I think, you know, where there is a lot of concern is that in the greenwashing space, that this really is an intentional mislabeling of products. And from a biodiversity perspective, you know, it is a, a risk because monitoring biodiversity is a challenge, right? And so, you know, you're not able to necessarily rely on quantitative figures all the time from a biodiversity perspective to ensure that those claims are legitimate. Um, and we've got a real balancing act to achieve as a sector, right? Because we want the sector to grow. We can't necessarily wait for those perfect metrics. I heard a wonderful saying, we can't let perfect be the enemy of progress, mm. right? And I buy into that. But in the same time, there's got to be some guardrails out there, right? That, you know, everyone's aligned in a similar direction. So I think that it is a risk in this in in the biodiversity space, but I do think that uh, people are well aware of it. There are a number of initiatives underway to produce those guardrails, and that's only going to serve the the market uh, and its growth in the long term. I think for the vast majority of biodiversity, it is like you say, an impossible task almost to measure it and monitor it. Uh, I think when we chatted last, we also mentioned about we were looking at deforestation, you know, what's happening in the Amazon, mainly around food and beef production, et cetera. Um, Southeast Asia, palm oil over there. I know these are matters very close to your heart, but you can almost geo-mapping, actually see what's happening happening in terms of deforestation. And I encourage you to stay on for the remainder of our webinar. We have um, Tracy Vessels from SAPI joining us, and maybe she can enlighten us a little bit more as well. We, I'll see if I have time to go down that road with her on in terms of what deforestation is currently looking at like and what are they doing in terms of their conservation efforts because I, I know they do try to offset certain amounts of their land. I think it might even be as much as 30% to conservation specifically. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on which which I found in incredibly sort of interesting and different about the way you guys are approaching this is typically when we say we're an ESG investor, a client assumes they are getting the best ESG performing company in that portfolio, that they're getting the market leaders. Um, and you made the point almost Where's the real world impact of that? Surely there's more benefit in actually selecting the worst and getting them up to speed with where the rest of the, the best players in, the, in that economy are, are, are acting. Yeah, Dave, and, and I apologize because uh, in your previous question, I failed to, to, to address your point about the Ocean Engagement Fund, which you know really talks to the point that you've just made, right? Which is that you know when we're looking at impact um, in a listed equity space, um, we really want to be able to move the dial as much as possible, right? And and the, the harsh reality we face is that for most of those companies, there is going to be a negative footprint on biodiversity, on natural resources, right? I mean, that that's how a large chunk of our economies work. So, you know, we need to acknowledge that the, those companies aren't going to go anywhere. Um, they will continue to have an impact on biodiversity and a negative one. But how do we reduce that impact as much as possible? And that really speaks to your point, right? Is that, yeah, there are a number of, of outperformers out there, and those are fantastic companies. And yes, the, you know, in many investment theses, those are the companies that are getting allocations of capital. I think that the nasty truth that perhaps, you know, a lot of people don't want to deal with is that if you want your capital to have an impact, right? that actually investing in those laggards is a huge, huge opportunity. Because if you can get one of those laggards to move the dial a bit, it's actually a material impact for the sector relative to what one of your leaders will be able to achieve. And, you know, that's a central thesis of our Ocean Engagement Fund is, you know, we want to be able to work with laggards. Um, and I say laggards, not in the commercial sense, obviously, um, but simply that they are late to, to the party on certain sustainability topics. And that really does present an opportunity as well, because, you know, we often will imagine or, or there's a perception that the laggards are intentionally laggards, right? Um, and I can tell you from my previous role at ZSL, where we were engaging a lot of corporates, a lot of the time it just stems from zero awareness of the topic. You know, people are going in and trying to have a conversation with them about changing their behavior on the assumption that they understand the implications to sustainability, or in my case, biodiversity. 
but actually many of these people are at the beginning of that journey. And we need to acknowledge that as a sector and from an engagement perspective, engagement needs to be designed to accommodate that. Um, you know, we need to, to focus on bringing everyone on the journey and it's never too late for these companies to start the journey. Yeah, thanks, Oliver. I think we've had our own self-reflection moment and in including biodiversity only as recent as last year. It wasn't something that was immediately on our thinking when we were re talking about sustainability. I mean, you know, we were looking closely at climate change, um, social inclusion, uh, people diversity. Um, but the more you look at something like biodiversity, you realize how actually pressing it is. Um, but we haven't... Uh, just add as well. Just a quick point is, is that very often, because you mentioned climate change is almost biodiversity was the next thing. Mm. You know, I think there are a lot of similarities uh, and there's no doubt that the climate agenda is making it easier to get biodiversity traction as a topic, right? Mm. But I think there's a really, really important distinction that, that needs to be made. That in the climate agenda, we're very often talking about exiting entire sectors, right? Um, we're talking about stranded assets because of those exits. The reality is, you, you touched on population growth, they all need to be fed. So as much as yes, agriculture is a key driver of biodiversity loss, it's not a sector that we're exiting because we have to feed everyone, mm -hmm. right? We don't have that disinvestment opportunity, if you will, easy option. There is no easy option here. It's hard conversations and change. I guess even the same in the climate change discussion, it's around okay, the energy transition, you know, as we want to wean off fossil fuels, but growing population, energy demands, uh, particularly in developing countries, argue they need to, to power their homes and the industry to just better the livelihoods of their people. And there is this transition that takes place. And going back to the question of greenwashing, you know, if you're a manager saying, look, we don't hold these technologies, and actually you're not really participating in that transition. Or, you know, if you're not holding the green technology companies, you know, you say you're looking at, we hold a portfolio of fintech stocks, therefore we have a very low CRT footprint and we align with climate change. You're actually not participating in the climate change journey. And that's also kind of a tricky nuance to manage uh, within the greenwashing space as well. And maybe that's what the SFDR is trying to do. And I think you raise a really important point, which is how each sector is different, right? And and this again talks to that, that question about materiality and complexity. Um, you know, and we, we discuss palm oil, for example, right, where unfortunately palm oil has almost fallen into that climate debate where people view it as like we're, we're going to exit the sector completely. Mm. Uh, you know, that that's a huge risk to biodiversity, right? The IUCN actually came out with a paper to try and, you know, manage the direction of travel on this topic because, again, we need to provide vegetable oil to a growing population, the most efficient vegetable oil in the world is palm oil. Mm. When we start looking at alternatives and, and their equivalent land use that will it will be required, we're just going to lose even more biodiversity. Uh, so it is, it's super nuanced, it's super detailed. And I mean, that's where, you know, unfortunately, again, we can't do everything all at once, you know. And so for us, again, going back to your question earlier about materiality, it really is, okay, where do we focus? Right. And, you know, from a, a risk perspective, we focus a lot on, on agri and, and forestry um, and rightfully so, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I think if we you spoke earlier about biodiversity means something different for someone in different locations. And I mean, biodiversity, you can think of it as the the the, the variance and the variability um, and the variety of living life within an ecosystem and the hotspots typically I say hotspots, but where it's the most heightened and most um, compact at least if that's the right word is along the green belt essentially the equator as you move through you know south america the amazon into you know central africa there and into southeast asia um when indonesia and borneo etc where a lot of that palm oil is now taking shape and we also fall into that trap when those forests are getting burned down to to plant palm oil um i remember the big story was oh, all this peat under the ground is festering and borneo in a single year emitted more co2 from forest burning than india's entire history with maybe not necessarily also acknowledging the biodiversity loss that took place at that same time. I think the headline story was the CO2 emissions from the burning. Um, 
but we're evolving and we're learning and we're moving on. I think as a society and particularly as an industry, we have a lot of room to go. Um, and I really appreciate the, the stance that you guys have taken in, in those two focus areas as well. And just as a parting question, we run out of time. Um, I wish I could have you for the full hour. Is uh, more kind of next generation or next products that you guys are looking at? Because maybe the one that got a decent amount of attention was I think you did a blue bond with the Belize government and we haven't even touched on government yet in our discussion. I think that is a key role player in this challenge, if not maybe even the biggest key player in this challenge. Absolutely, Dave. And I mean, listen, I think that the, the Blue Bond is, is a great example of what governments can do in conjunction with the private sector, right? So, I mean, that was Credit Suisse along with partners like the Nature Conservancy, um, who were really driving that agenda. And I think it's it's really talking to this idea that you've got different skill sets that are sitting within different organizations and different sectors. Uh, there is opportunity to bring all of those together to do these kind of deals. Um, I mean, the, the Blue Bond for Belize, you know, really is a landmark deal as well because it's the largest of its kind that's been executed. Um, but really the intent around debt for nature swaps is the ability for a government uh, representing a, a sovereign country um, to be able to rebalance its books, right, from a debt perspective. And I think that that's even more prevalent uh, in a COVID world. Um, where we know that the, the debt burden is, is exceedingly worrisome for a number of countries. But we also know that there are a number of those, uh, those countries that hold that or investors that hold that debt who would like to see a biodiversity benefit um, and are willing to sit down at a table and discuss restructuring that debt uh, and sometimes actually, if you will, cancelling some of that debt if it means that the country is going to deliver certain conservation benefits and outcomes. Uh, and I think it's a huge opportunity for us to be able to create funding mechanisms for conservation in countries um, and long-term funding, right? And that's a critical thing is, you know, you talk to managers on the ground, they need line of sight. They need to build long-term strategies. Biodiversity, we can't generate that stuff in 12 months. We can destroy it in a day, right? but the recovery takes time uh, and we need to afford our conservation managers the luxury of funding and time of funding. Uh, and so I think the ability for us to use these, these debt swaps um, it, it is huge. And, you know, we, we're obviously, the Belize one was focused on marine, um, but I mean, in theory, you could apply the same uh, process and financial engineering to terrestrial landscapes, for example. Uh, and I think that we're only starting to scratch the surface of nature-based solutions, a lot of focus on climate at the moment. But I mean, when we start looking at the ability for natural capital in, for example, South Africa to be producing carbon credits, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a huge opportunity. Presents a number of questions, legal rights, equity, who owns it, what communities are custodians, but again, those are nice challenges for us to be addressing, you know, and as much as there's a whole lot of risk in this space, man, there's some really exciting opportunities as well. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. We always like to end off on an optimistic note. Uh, we haven't even touched on the ocean economy. Uh, the ocean does, I think, sequester about a quarter of the atmosphere's uh, emissions and CO2. Um, so, again, brings in that relationship. Uh, we also have um, my daughter Kamalo from Sea Harvest, you'll be glad to know, joining us later today. And we'll talk a little bit more about sustainable fishing practices. Um, but Oliver, we could just go on and on. But thank you so much for your time. I think you, you left us with a lot of food for thought, excuse the pun, um, given your focus on agriculture. But you also that, that inconvenient truth um, that you mentioned earlier, I think you might have said a harsh truth. Um, so a lot for us to, to take home and think about. And we really appreciate your time this morning. And take care and enjoy uh, a sarcastically sunny London. Dave, thanks very much for having me. Okay, take care. Bye.